Hi everyone and welcome to another episode with the Apostate Prophet. If you are familiar with discussions and polemics surrounding Islam, you have probably heard of the word kafir, which basically refers to non-Muslims. The word is quite interesting because it means so much more than what some people think it means, and it is still very frequently used today in the 21st century, even in Western countries among immigrants for example. It has also evolved into more words, derogatory words, in non-Arabic speaking Muslim cultures or others. It sounds like a beautiful word, let's find out what it means. Kafir is nowadays commonly translated as infidel, someone who doesn't follow the true religion. According to Islamic teachings, someone who doesn't follow Islam after hearing it and rejecting it is a kafir. Someone who opposes Islam is obviously a kafir, very self-explanatory. Someone who leaves Islam is both an apostate, a murtad, and a kafir, who also needs to be captured and killed as soon as possible, if he rejects the invitation to re-embrace Islam within a short time, the religion of peace. There is one matter of dispute regarding Jews and Christians, but the common scholarly consensus is that both Christians and Jews, who explicitly reject Muhammad and therefore Islam, are kafir. Regarding Christians who believe in the divinity of Jesus, the Quran makes that very clear already. They have certainly disbelieved who say Allah is the Messiah, son of Mary. Christians will go to hell. I think this is very clear, so when someone tries to tell you that Islam is totally tolerant with Christians, you can just call bullshit on that. So basically, if you willingly don't follow Islam, you are a kafir. Welcome to the kafir club. In today's time, some people might not be able to fully understand the implications of this term. Therefore, I want to bring you back a little bit to older times, the times when Islam came into existence, and the centuries after that. Human relations and rights were quite different when Muhammad started to proclaim his message in Arabia in the 7th century. He didn't live in a republic where people are citizens. In pre-Islamic Arabia's tribal environment, just like in many other places in the world at that time, you as a person were not just a free person who could do whatever he wants to do. You were under the protection of a bigger group, a clan or a tribe. And therefore anyone who would kill you would drag himself into a blood feud and had to pay with blood on his own side, on his own clan's side for example. Anyone who wronged you from a different clan had to pay for that. If the clan had a justification, a good reason, they could also expel you from the clan. And your blood would be therefore not protected anymore and you could be randomly robbed and killed. Muhammad, for example, was part of the Hashim clan that initially protected him. But after he declared Islam and started to insult the traditions and the holies of his own clan, of his own tribe, he was threatened with expulsion and assassination. Now what does all of that have to do with Islam and the word kafir? Well, when Muhammad declared Islam and it slowly turned into a large religion, this tribal system turned into a much bigger but similar system of tribalism. Only this time, your protection didn't depend on your heritage and your blood, but on your faith. If we look at early documents on how Islam handled public affairs, we can look at Muhammad's Medina Charter, for example, or the Pact of Omar, a very important document to the Islamic legal system. In that, we can see that everyone who is a Muslim is naturally protected by the ruling Islamic State. The difference between this and the old tribalism is that a Muslim has higher rights than other factions, other religions. A non-believer may not offend a Muslim, he has to respect a Muslim, so much that he has to give his seat to a Muslim and can not quarrel with a Muslim. The infidel on the other side, the kafir, is a lower class, a group that is either fought and killed or fought and subjugated and taken protection money from, jizya, or the group can flee to other lands. So the kafir is basically a lower human with lesser rights, someone who is bad just by his disbelief in Islam. But wasn't Islam a religion that gave all equal rights and respected people? One of my favorite verses, chapter 9 verse 29, makes this whole ruling about taxing and fighting the infidel very clear. The consensus of Islamic scholars is also very clear on this. All the caliphates, including the one Muhammad set up, also practiced this. But maybe they all just misunderstood Islam. 
When we come to apostates, we can understand the death sentence for apostasy better if we think about it taking the tribal origins of Islam into consideration. Someone who is a Muslim is under Islamic protection. When he leaves Islam, he would no longer have a right to this protection. He would be expelled because he discards the most basic requirement to be under this protection, being a Muslim. And the Islamic hegemony also wouldn't want this individual to go over to one of those lesser, other groups, those non-believers. Therefore, an apostate needs to return within short time, or according to Islam, he is executed. So, labeling someone a disbeliever, a kafir, basically means you are not one of us. Better watch your step. Aside from that, now that we have understood Islam's supremacist system, the word kafir is not very innocent in itself. I always find it funny when Muslims mention the Jewish word goy, gentile, to somehow imply that there is a big evil in Judaism. When gentile simply means people, nation, non-Jews. The word kafir is not that innocent. It refers to someone who covers, who hides the truth, which is Islam. So the word itself, when given to someone who doesn't believe in Islam, implies that the kafir, the infidel, is someone who hides the truth of Islam and is therefore bad, evil, an enemy. That's why the Quran deals in most of its content with the evil, filthy infidel and makes all kinds of insults, accusations and threats against the infidel. That's why it's very common to see Muslim apologists say stuff like, you know Islam is true, you are just denying it. Of course, I want to burn in hell, for all eternity, just for fun. Or, you know Islam is true, you are just jealous. Yeah, I'm so jealous, I so badly want my world to look like this. And I so badly want to look like this guy. Let me tell you one thing, brother. I am a medical doctor. And I'm a medical doctor. The word kafir also evolved into words like gavur or gavur in Persian or Turkish. Turks, from my own experience, use this word very, very commonly when they refer to non-Muslims, to Germans in Germany, or generally to people from non-Muslim cultures as a slur. I can't even imagine the outrage if Europeans, Americans acted this way. There is also a word kafir in Africa, which is used against black people in Africa. This racial slur, which is basically the African equivalent of the N-word, also comes from the word kafir, that Muslims used to use very much against black people, because black people were generally considered non-Muslims, immoral non-Muslims, lesser people. The word has such hostility and is emphasized so much in the Quran, that's why we have authentic, traditional Islamic hadith, where Muhammad was ordered to fight the non-believers until everyone obeys the true religion, Islam, submission. The Quran is not very nice to the kafir. It calls us blind, deaf, dumb, sick, corrupt, corrupted, deserving of punishment, deluded, the worst of creation. Allah says that he mocks us infidels. Well, I don't know about that. I think I'm much better at mocking Allah, Muhammad's creation. No wonder it is not allowed in Islam to take the kafir as a friend, to give charity to a kafir, to pray after us, to like us, to be like us. Because we are only the enemy of Allah, disgraced, cursed, and destroyed. But let's just focus on an early small chapter in the Quran where the Quran peacefully says, to you is your religion and to me is mine. Let's just forget about all these insults and curses toward the non-believer. They are only in the most holy book of Islam. Personally, I'm very proud of all these qualities that the Quran ascribes to us, the kafir. Better than following a sick desert god who is obsessed with his prophet's sexual desires and needs. Better than giving up my identity and turning myself into a 7th century Arab. Better than idolizing and calling perfect a 50-year-old merchant who is sexually attracted by a 6-year-old child. I am proudly a kafir, and you should be one too. Thanks for watching. My videos are mostly not monetized, so if you want to support me, please consider supporting me on Patreon or on apostateprofit.com. Thank you all so much for your contribution. I will be back with so much more. Have a great day and be a kafir. Stay away from Islam.